Monsignor Jim Lasanti. You are watching Mass for Palm Sunday called Passion Sunday from Our Lady of Lourdes in Massapequa Park. Thank you for joining us as we pray. And I'm going to begin by uh, praying with you, reading out the entrance antiphon for Palm Sunday. Six days before Passover, when the Lord came into the city of Jerusalem, the children ran to meet him. In their hands they carried palm branches and with a loud voice cried out, Hosanna in the highest. Blessed are you who have come in your abundant mercy. O gates, lift high your heads, grow higher ancient doors. Let him enter, King of glory. And who is this King of glory? He, the Lord of hosts, he is the King of glory. Hosanna in the highest, blessed are you who have come in your abundant mercy. And so we begin our Mass in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Dear friends, the Lord be with you. And with your spirit. To better celebrate Mass on Palm Sunday, like every Sunday, we take a moment to reflect, to confess our sins, to ask God for his forgiveness. In this time of challenge for a whole world, it's easy sometimes to give in to doubt and discouragement. For the times our faith has been weak, Lord, have mercy. Lord, we're called on in this time in which we're threatened by something very, very frightening for so many, that our family and our friends matter so much. For the times we've taken our families for granted or failed to love as we should, Christ, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. And for the good we are called to do each day for others in a selfless and giving way, for the missed opportunities to do that good, the sins of omission, Lord, have mercy. And may Almighty God have mercy on us, forgive us our sins, and bring us all to everlasting life. Amen. Amen. And so we pray. Almighty and ever-living God, who is an example of humility for the human race to follow, caused our Savior to take flesh and to submit to the cross. Graciously grant that we may heed his lesson of patient and loving suffering, and so merit a share in his glorious resurrection. And we ask this through he who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. A reading from the book of the prophet Isaiah. The Lord has given me a well-trained tongue that I might know how to speak to the weary, a word that will rouse them. Morning after morning, he opens my ear that I may hear. And I have not rebelled, have not turned my back. I gave my back to those who beat me, my cheeks to those who plucked my beard, my face I did not shield from buffets and spitting. The Lord God is my help, therefore I am not disgraced. I have set my face like flint, knowing that I shall not be put to shame. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. The response is, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? My God, my God, why have you abandoned me? All who seek me scoff at me. They mock me with parted lips. They wag their heads. He relied on the Lord. Let him deliver him. Let him rescue him if he loves him. My God, my God, why have you abandoned me? Indeed, many dogs surround me. A pack of evildoers closes in upon me. They have pierced my hands and my feet. I can count all my bones. My, my God, God, my God, God why, why have, have you abandoned, abandoned me? me? They divide my garments among them, and for my vesture they cast lots. But you, O Lord, be not far from me. O my help, hasten to aid me. My, my God, God, my God, God why, why have you abandoned, abandoned me? me? I will proclaim your name to my brethren. In the midst of the assembly, I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him, all you descendants of Jacob. Give glory to him, revere him, all you descendants of Israel. My God, my God, why have you abandoned me? A reading from the letter of St. Paul to the Philippians. Christ Jesus, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God something to be grasped. Rather, he emptied himself taking the form of a slave, coming in human likeness, 
and found human in appearance, he humbled himself, becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. Because of this, God greatly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bend, of those in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ, King of endless glory. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ, King of endless glory. Christ became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Because of this, God greatly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name. Praise, Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ, Christ King, King of endless, endless glory. The Passion of Our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Matthew. One of the, one of the twelve, who was called Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priests and said, what are you willing to give me if I hand him over to you? They paid him 30 pieces of silver, and from that time on, he looked for an opportunity to hand him over. On the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the disciples approached Jesus and said, Where do you want us to prepare for you to eat the Passover? He said, Go into the city to a certain man and tell him, The teacher says, My appointed time draws near. In your house I shall celebrate the Passover with my disciples. The disciples then did as Jesus had ordered and prepared the Passover. When it was evening, he reclined at table with the twelve, and while they were eating, he said, Amen, I say to you, one of you will betray me. Deeply distressed at this, they began to say to him, one after another, Surely it is not I, Lord. He said in reply, He who has dipped his hand into the dish with me is the one who will betray me. The Son of Man indeed goes as it is written of him. But woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would be better for that man if he had never been born. Then Judas, his betrayer, said in reply, Surely it is not I, Rabbi. He answered, You have said so. While they were eating, Jesus took bread, said the blessing, broke it, and giving it to his disciples, said, Take and eat. This is my body. Then he took a cup, gave thanks, gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which will be shed on behalf of many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, from now on I shall not drink this fruit of the vine until the day when I drink it with you new in the kingdom of my Father. Then, after singing a hymn, they went to the Mount of Olives. Then Jesus said to them, This night all of you will have your faith in me shaken, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock will be dispersed. But after I have been raised up, I shall go before you to Galilee. Peter said to him in reply, Though all may have their faith in you shaken, mine will never be. Jesus said to him, Amen, I say to you, this very night before the cock crows, you will deny me three times. Peter said to him, Even though I should have to die with you, I will not deny you. And all the disciples spoke likewise. Then Jesus came with them to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to his disciples, Sit here while I go over there and pray. He took along Peter and the two sons of Zebedee and began to feel sorrow and distress. Then he said to them, My soul is sorrowful even to death. Remain here and keep watch with me. He advanced a little and fell prostrate in prayer, saying, My father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. When he returned to his disciples, he found them asleep. He said to Peter, So you could not keep watch with me for one hour? Watch and pray that you may not undergo the test. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Withdrawing a second time, he prayed again. My father, if it is not possible that this cup pass without my drinking it, your will be done. Then he returned once more and found them asleep, for they could not keep their eyes open. He left them and withdrew again and prayed a third time, saying the same thing. 
Then he returned to his disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and taking your rest? Behold, the hour is at hand when the Son of Man is to be handed over to sinners. Get up, let us go. Look, my betrayer is at hand. While he was still speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, arrived, accompanied by a large crowd with swords and clubs, who had come from the chief priest and the elders of the people. His betrayer had arranged a sign with them, saying, The man I shall kiss is the one. Arrest him. Immediately he went over to Jesus and said, Hail, Rabbi. And he kissed him. Jesus answered him, Friend, do what you have come for. Then stepping forward, they laid hands on Jesus and arrested him. And behold, one of those who accompanied Jesus put his hand to his sword, drew it, and struck the high priest's servant, cutting off his ear. Then Jesus said to him, Put your sword back into its sheath, for all who take the sword will perish by the sword. Do you think that I cannot call upon my Father, and he will not provide me at this moment with more than twelve legions of angels? But then how will the scriptures be fulfilled, which say that it must come to pass in this way? At that hour, Jesus said to the crowds, Have you come out as against the robber with swords and clubs to seize me day after day? I sat teaching in the temple area, yet you did not arrest me. But all this has come to pass, that the writings of the prophets may be fulfilled. Then all the disciples left him and fled. Those who had arrested Jesus led him away to Caiaphas, the high priest, where the scribes and the elders were assembled. Peter was following him at a distance as far as the high priest's courtyard, and going inside, he sat down with the servants to see the outcome. The chief priests and the entire Sanhedrin kept trying to obtain false testimony against Jesus in order to put him to death. But they found none, though many false witnesses came forward. Finally, two came forward who stated, This man said, I can destroy the temple of God and within three days rebuild The high priest rose and addressed him. Have you no answer? What are these men testifying against you? But Jesus was silent. Then the high priest said to him, I order you to tell us under oath before the living God whether you are the Christ, Son of God. Jesus said to him in reply, You have said so, but I tell you, from now on you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of the power and coming on the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his robes and said, He has blasphemed. What further need have we of witnesses? You have now heard the blasphemy. What is your opinion? They said in reply, He deserves to die. They spat in his face and struck him, while some slapped him, saying, Prophecy for us, Christ. Who is it that struck you? Now Peter was sitting outside in the courtyard. One of the maids came over to him and said, You too were with Jesus of Galilee. But he denied it in front of everyone, saying, I do not know what you are talking about. As he went out to the gate, another girl saw him and said to those who were there, This man was with Jesus the Nazarene. Again, he denied it with an oath. I do not know the man. A little later, the bystanders came over and said to Peter, Surely you too are one of them. Even his speech gives you away. At that, he began to curse and to swear. I do not know the man. And immediately a cock crowed. Then Peter remembered the word that Jesus had spoken. Before the cock crows, you will deny me three times. He went out and began to weep bitterly. When it was morning, all the chief priests and the elders of the people took counsel against Jesus to put him to death. They bound him, led him away, and handed him over to Pilate, the governor. Then Judas, his betrayer, seeing that Jesus had been condemned, deeply regretted what he had done. He returned the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders, saying, I have sinned in betraying innocent blood. They said, What is that to us? Look to it yourself. Flinging the money into the temple, he departed and went off and hanged himself. The chief priests gathered up the money, but said, It is not lawful to deposit this in the temple treasury. What is the price of blood? After consultation, they used it to buy the potter's field as a burial place for foreigners. That is why that field even today is called the field of blood. Then it was fulfilled what had been said through Jeremiah the prophet. And they took the 30 pieces of silver, the value of a man with a price on his head, a price, by some, a price set by some of the Israelites, and they paid it out for the potter's field, just as the Lord had commanded me. Now Jesus stood before the governor, Pontius Pilate, 
and he questioned him. Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus said, You say so. And when he was accused by the chief priests and elders, he made no answer. Then Pilate said to him, Do you not hear how many things they are testifying against you? But he did not answer one word. So the governor was greatly amazed. Now on the occasion of the feast, the governor was accustomed to release to the crowd one prisoner whom they wished. And at that time, they had a notorious prisoner called Barabbas. So when they had assembled, Pilate said to them, Which one do you want me to release to you, Barabbas or Jesus called Christ? For he knew that it was out of envy, envy that they handed him over. While he was still seated at the bench, his wife sent him a message. Have nothing to do with that righteous man. I suffered much in a dream today because of him. The chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowds to ask for Barabbas, but to destroy Jesus. The governor said to them in reply, Which of the two do you want me to release to you? They answered, Barabbas. Pilate said to them, Then what shall I do with Jesus called Christ? They all said, Let him be crucified. But he said, Why? What evil has he done? They only shouted the louder. Let him be crucified. When Pilate saw that he was not succeeding at all, but that, a, but that a riot was breaking out instead, he took water and washed his hands in the sight of the crowd, saying, I am innocent of this man's blood. Look to it yourselves. And the whole people said in reply, His blood be upon us and upon our children. Then he released Barabbas to them, but after he had Jesus scourged, he handed him over to be crucified. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the praetorium and gathered the whole cohort around him. They stripped off his clothes and threw a scarlet military cloak about him. Weaving a crown out of thorns, they placed it on his head and a reed in his right hand. And kneeling before him, they mocked him, saying, Hail, hey, King of the Jews. They spat upon him and took the reed and kept striking him on the head. And when they had mocked him, they stripped him of the cloak, dressed him in his clothes, and led him off to crucify him. As they were going out, they met a Cyrenian named Simon. This man they pressed into service to carry, the, to carry the cross. And when they came to a place called Golgotha, which means place of the skull, they gave Jesus wine to drink mixed with gall. But when he had tasted it, he refused to drink. After they had crucified him, they divided his garments by casting lots. Then they sat down and kept watch over him there. And they placed over his, over his head the written charge against him. This is Jesus, King of the Jews. Two revolutionaries were crucified with him, one on his right and the other on his left. Those passing by reviled him, shaking their head and saying, You who destroyed the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself, if you are the Son of God, and come down from the cross. Likewise, the chief priests with the scribes and the elders mocked him and said, He saved others, he cannot save himself, so he is the King of Israel. Let him come down from the cross now. The revolutionaries who were crucified with him also kept abusing him in the same way. From noon onward, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. And at about three o'clock, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Lemoi Eli, lema sabachthani, which means, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Some of the bystanders who heard it said, This one is calling for Elijah. Immediately, one of them ran to get a sponge. He soaked it in wine and putting it on a reed, gave it to him to drink. But the rest said, Wait, let us see if Elijah comes to save him. But Jesus cried out again in a loud voice and gave up his spirit. And behold, the veil of the sanctuary was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth quaked, rocks were split, tombs were opened, and the bodies of many saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming forth from the tombs, after their resurrection, they entered the holy city and appeared to many. The, the centurion and the men with him who were keeping watch over Jesus feared greatly when they saw the earthquake and all that was happening. And they said, Surely this was the 
the Son of God. There were many women there looking on from a distance who had followed Jesus from Galilee, ministering to him. Among them were Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James and Joseph, and the mother of the sons of Zebedee. When it was evening, there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph, who was himself a, a disciple of Jesus. He went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then, then Pilate ordered it to be handed over. Taking the body, Joseph wrapped it in clean linen and laid it in his new tomb that he had hewn in the rock. Then he rolled a huge stone across the entrance to the tomb and departed. But Mary Magdalene and the other Mary remained sitting there, facing the tomb. The next day, the one following the preparation, the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered before Pilate and said, Sir, we remember that this imposter wants to know why you said, After three days I will be raised up. Give orders then that the grave be secured until the third day. Let his disciples come and kill him and say to the people, He has been raised from the dead. This last imposter would be worse than the first. Pilate said to them, The guard is yours. Go, secure it as best you can. So they went and secured the tomb, fixing a seal to the stone and setting the guard. The word of the Lord. Thanks. Thanks be to you. I'd like to again thank you for joining us for our Palm Sunday celebration. We're encouraged by the church not to give a long homily, that the passion itself is powerful enough that we really don't need many words today. But let me say a few things. First of all, uh, that this Mass is being offered I'm sure masses throughout the country today are being offered for all those who are battling the uh, coronavirus, uh, not just those who are fighting it because they physically have been afflicted, but also for their families who support them, for their families in many cases who can't be with them in the hospital but are praying intently for them. I pray so deeply and, and profoundly for the, the doctors and the nurses and the EMTs and the police and the firefighters and all those people on the front lines who are doing what they can to try to help those who are suffering. This is a remarkable time in world history, and once again, great and selfless people step forward because they care. In particular, I'm praying for my friend Anthony Preziosi, local man who is fighting for his life right now, much loved by his family and community. To me, he represents all those good people who are trying their best to beat this thing back because they love life, and we pray for Anthony and all those who are suffering from the virus, and we pray for a cure, we pray for a vaccination, and we pray for good and selfless people to serve the needs of people like our friend Anthony. Also, a word of thanks. You know, last week I had the opportunity to say, please don't forget to support your parish financially as well in these times, and so many of you responded. You know, I got a letter from a uh, Mary Lou Frisbee from Goodyear, Arizona, writing to us in New York saying, I know, like many parishes in New York, that you people are suffering, so here's my contribution. Just one of many, many signs of people caring but even in these times when it could be easily a chance to be self-absorbed, people are thinking outside themselves and trying to do what they can for the good and sake of others. So thanks to Mary Lou and all of you for your kindness and generosity. Let's talk a little bit about this thing, Palm Sunday, Passion Sunday. What's happening this day? Jesus is entering Jerusalem and everyone thinks he's the next big deal. He's the Messiah. He's the one we've been waiting for. He's the King of Kings. That's the, the general press about Jesus. So people are greeting him, and you know, the reason you receive, usually, not this year, palm from your church, is because that's what they did back then. In lieu of confetti, they would shake palm and sing Hosanna, praising the next king, the, the savior, the one we've been waiting for, the Messiah. Now on Sunday, Palm Sunday, the crowds will welcome Jesus with great enthusiasm because they say, this is him, this is the Messiah we await. Keep this in mind, within five days, by Good Friday, that same crowd will be yelling, as we heard in the Passion a moment ago, crucify him, crucify him. How could it be that people would find themselves in a position of cheering a man on Sunday and by Friday calling for his death, his painful death at Golgotha? How is that possible? Now we can look back in time and say those people, they just were awful people. We can almost see this as a feast of fickleness. How can you, on the one hand, be praising him and within five days turn so completely against him, 180 degrees, that you call for this good and innocent man's death? Now, when we look at those people, and we call this the Feast of Fickleness, and we look at them and think, how ignorant could they be to turn on our Lord so quickly? Maybe, just maybe, it's time for us to look in the spiritual mirror of our lives. And I'll start with a personal confession. 
not just with coronavirus, but in so many crises in my life, I found myself playing what I'll call the uh, Monty Hall prayer. You know Monty Hall, let's make a deal. I think for many of us in our personal and private and spiritual lives, that we, that's what we do. We know God is there, we're happy he's there, not too much time spent with him intensely. And then we get into a crisis, you know, a situation which is difficult, and we start making deals with God. And I know in the midst of this virus and the, the death and the sickness all around us, lots of us are praying, hey Lord, make this better, take it away. And we promise we'll be better, we'll learn, we'll be better people. But the reality is, the truth is, importantly, that I'm afraid so many times we are as naive as those people who on Sunday today are cheering Hosanna to Jesus and by Friday we'll be saying crucify him. That we're all guilty of being part of the feast of fickleness. That so often we only turn to God in times of crisis. I can remember in personal crisis praying intensely. I can remember because I lived through it like many of you, 9-11, praying intensely for those people who had died and for those who were suffering. I can remember too, Hurricane Sandy, Superstorm Sandy. Oh Lord, let us be spared from this terrible thing. In all of our crises, we're quick to turn to God, but how long does it last? And I guess I'm wondering now too, as we pray intensely for this terrible virus to leave us, for our world to be freed from this scourge, can we for once truly learn not just to pray in a Monty Hall way, making deals with God when we're most in need, but can we use this opportunity, this Passion Sunday, to say, Lord, I don't want to be those people cheering you one day and condemning you the next. I don't want to be a, a fair-weather friend of God. I want to be someone who is there for you and believes in you and prays to you and is connected to you equally, always, in good times and in bad. I don't want to make a deal with you. I want you to know that I'm yours and I trust in you every day of my life, not just when I'm in serious and terrible trouble. We're in some pretty serious and ter terrible trouble now, and we understand why we're all turning back to God and praying, but let it not be when this thing, please God, passes, that we are people who once again go back to our old style of only thinking about what I need today, and not thinking about the bigger picture of what can I do with the life I've been given for others. One of the things that's probably, I think for all of us happened during this crisis, is we realize the fragility of life. People we knew who were healthy yesterday are sick today. And it can make us very, very easily be focused on the importance of faith. But our faith isn't just there when times are hard. Our faith should be and must be there at all times. So I'm hoping and praying that through this crisis, we become convinced to be not occasional Christians, not occasional Catholics, but full-time in our belief, in our dependence in God, and our willingness to belong to him always and forever. One final thought. You know, I had the opportunity, many of you know who've known me for years, of uh, befriending and knowing intimately the wonderful film director, Frank Capra. And I've always loved his film, It's a Wonderful Life, is one of my favorites. But if you remember the beginning of the film, you have St. Joseph, St. Peter talking up in the clouds, and they're talking about George Bailey, played by Jimmy Stewart, who's in a terrible way. And they call on Clarence, his guardian angel, to come. And Clarence says to him, well, what's wrong with George Bailey? Is he sick? And uh, you know what they say back to him? No, worse than that. He's discouraged. Discouragement, I think, is, in this age, something we've got to be careful about. It's so easy to give up hope and not to believe, to see all the dangers around us and the sadness around us, and to give in to despair, to give in to discouragement. But we are, by virtue of our Christianity, called on to be people of hope, to be people who listen to Jesus when he says, be not afraid to believe in a Jesus who says, in the midst of every crisis, peace be with you. And I'll close with one more story, it happens to be real. I had the privilege about a year ago of marrying this couple, Francie and Michael, and Francie's a nurse. Well, she came up with several weeks ago, on duty, uh, picking up the virus. Uh, she took time off to try to get as well as she could, but she's back at the job right now. Anyway, this past week, she had the care of a young 28-year-old man who had the virus, of course, not surrounded by family because the family couldn't come to the hospital. Very quickly, he took ill, and very quickly, he died. And Francis said, it's so sad to me that this man who had a family and people who loved him died alone. To which I said, no, he didn't die alone, Francis. Not only was he surrounded by the goodness of God, but you, as a nurse on the front line, were there for him so that he didn't have to die alone. 
The story of people like Francie who are there for those who are most critically ill gives me the hope, the promise, that even in a world that sometimes seems to be overwhelmed by things that are evil, there are so many good people out there, so many people who are rising to the occasion of being selfless and generous and checking on their neighbors and making the calls that need to be made. And God bless these doctors and nurses and frontline people who go to work every day knowing that they're putting their very lives at risk. We come out of this either with discouragement or with hope. And I trust that on Passion Sunday, we will say, Lord, give me the spirit not to give in to the great curse of discouragement, but to look around and see the marvelous deeds of the people you have created and to see the world not as a place that is hopeless, but hopeful. Not as a place filled with selfishness, but filled with so many people who selflessly day in and day out are rising to the occasion. This is an opportunity to truly embrace what is a grace-filled moment and to celebrate it. God willing, it will have the courage and the faith to do that. Don't give in to despair, don't give in to discouragement, but let's all of us try to be people of hope and confidence that with God and with the goodness of his people, everything is possible. Join me now in professing our faith in the words of our creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible. I believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, born of the Father before all ages, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, consubstantial with the Father. Through him all things were made for us men and for our salvation. He came down from heaven, and by the Holy Spirit was incarnate of the Virgin Mary and became man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried and rose again on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is adored and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. I believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. I confess one baptism for the forgiveness of sins, and I look forward to the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. And now, as we do always, we turn to the Father in heaven with our prayers of petition, confident that in the Lord's time and way, he always hears us and he always responds. The response is, Lord, hear our prayer that those to be baptized and received into the church this Easter may be kept safe from doubt and strong against all temptations, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. That those who have never heard of Jesus may come to know how much he suffered for them and may believe in his resurrection, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. That the saving death of Jesus may restore in us a deep reverence and respect for every human life for which he sacrificed his own life, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. That those in our parish and family members who are ill may enjoy the consolation of the Lord and the presence of their loved ones, especially Sister Anthony Therese, Betty Shine, Jean McKenna, Patrick Campbell, Carol McNeely, Carol McNeely, Jean Pryor, Anthony Antonellis, Conrad Smith, George Jelnick, Anthony Preziozzi, Michael Goth, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For all who have died, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For the intention of this Mass, Dorothea Ponzio, Jean Marie Roncalo, the Purgatorial Society, Marie Bonarigio, Monsignor Lasante, William Pesek, Barry Champney, Mary Messina, and Teresa Miliotto whom we remember at this Eucharist. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. And we pray especially for all those who are first responders in this crisis, all those on the front line battling this illness, for their well-being, uh, we pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord hear, hear our prayer. prayer. And we'll take all these intentions and give them to the Mother of God, asking Mary to be our advocate before her son, as we say together, Hail, Hail Mary, full, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now at the hour of our death. Amen.
I'm not going to uh, use it today, but I'm going to encourage all of you to listen to our Center for Disease Control and anytime you go out in this next week to wear the mask, if you can find one or to make one if you have to, but do this for your safety and for the safety of others. Blessed are you, Lord, God of all creation. Through your goodness, we have this bread to offer, which earth has given and human hands have made. It will become for us the bread of life. Blessed be God. God. By the mystery of this water and wine, may we come to share in the divinity of Christ, who humbled himself to share in our humanity. Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation, through your goodness we have this wine to drink. Fruit of the vine, work of human hands, it will become for us our spiritual drink. Blessed, Blessed be God forever. Lord God, we ask you to receive us and be pleased with the sacrifice we offer you with humble and contrite hearts. Lord, wash away my iniquity. Cleanse me from all of my sin. Pray, my brothers and sisters, that our sacrifice will be found acceptable to God, our Heavenly Father. May the Lord accept the sacrifice at our hands to the praise and the glory of his name for our good and the good of all his church. Through the passion of your only begotten Son, our Lord, may our reconciliation with you be near at hand, so that, though we do not merit it by our own deeds, yet by your holy sacrifice, may we be recipients of the grace and salvation you promise. May we feel already the effects of your divine mercy, and we ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. My friends, the Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly right and just, our duty and our salvation, always and everywhere, to give you thanks, Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and Eternal God. For through the saving passion of your Son, Jesus, the whole world has received a heart to confess the infinite power of your majesty, since by the wondrous power of the cross, your judgment on the world is now revealed and the authority of Christ crucified and your people saved. And so, Lord, with all the angels and saints in heaven, we too give thanks as in exaltation we acclaim. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. You are holy indeed, O Lord, you are the fount of all holiness. Let your Spirit come upon these gifts of bread and wine to make them holy, so that they may become for us the body and the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, at whose command we celebrate this Eucharist. Before he was given up to death, a death which he freely accepted out of love for us, Jesus took bread in his sacred hands and gave you, Father, thanks and praise. He broke the bread, gave it to his disciples and said, Take this, all of you, and eat of it. For this is my body, which will be given up for you. When supper was ended, Jesus took a chalice filled with the fruit of the vine. Again, Father, he thanked you for your goodness gave the chalice to his disciples and friends and said, Take this, all of you, and drink from it. For this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and everlasting covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. Let us proclaim the mystery of our faith. Dying, you destroyed our death. Rising, you restored our life. Lord Jesus, come in glory. Therefore, as we celebrate the memorial of Jesus' death and resurrection, we offer you, Lord, the bread of life and the chalice of eternal salvation. And we give you thanks that you counted us worthy to be in your presence and to minister to you. Humbly, we pray that partaking in the body and blood of Christ, we might all be gathered into one family by the grace of the Holy Spirit. Remember, Lord, your church spread throughout the world and make us grow in love together with Francis, our Pope, John, our Bishop, along with all the bishops, the clergy, the religious, and all of God's people. 
We ask you to bless and remember all of our brothers and sisters who've gone to their rest in the hope of rising again. Bring them and all the departed into the light of your presence. Have mercy on us all and make us worthy to share eternal life with Mary, the Virgin Mother of God, with Saint Joseph, her devoted spouse, along with all the saints and martyrs and angels who've done your will throughout the ages. May we praise you in union with them and give you glory through your Son and our brother, Jesus Christ the Lord. For it is through him, with him, in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, that all glory and honor is yours, Almighty Father, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. I'll ask you to join me now in praying the Lord's Prayer, the Our Father. And as we pray it today, let's pray for that simple gift of a consistent faith, not just to turn to him in times of crisis like now, but to be ever faithful, ever true to a God who never, ever gives up on us. In that trust we say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Deliver us, Lord, from every evil, and grant us peace in our day. In your mercy, keep us free from sin. Protect us from all anxiety as we wait in joyful hope for the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Lord Jesus Christ, you said to your apostles, I leave you my peace, my peace I give to you. Look not on our sins, but on the faith of your church, and grant us the peace and unity of your kingdom, where you live and reign, one God forever and ever. Amen. Amen. May the peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world, have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world, have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world, grant us peace. Lord Jesus Christ, with faith in your love and mercy, we eat your body and drink your blood. Let it not bring us condemnation, but health in mind and in body. My friends, behold the Lamb of God. Behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those who are called to the supper of the Lamb. Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof, but only say the word and my soul shall be healed. May the body and blood of Christ bring us all to share in everlasting life. Amen. Now I know that watching this Mass, you cannot physically receive the body and blood of Jesus Christ, but we can receive him spiritually. Up on the screen you'll find a prayer that I'll ask you to pray with me. It talks about our spiritual communion with the Lord. My Jesus, I believe in you. I believe that you are present in the most holy sacrament. I love you above all things, and I desire to receive you into my soul. Since I cannot, at this moment, receive you sacramentally, come at least spiritually into my heart. I embrace you as if you were already there, and I unite myself wholly to you. Never permit me to ever be separated from you. Amen. This is where we do our announcements, a couple of announcements. First of all, I wouldn't be a pastor if I didn't say, here's my envelope, my weekly contribution. I'm making sure I get it to my church, Our Lady of Lords, and I ask all of you to keep that in mind and to be as generous in your own parish. I hope Our, our Lady of Lords as you can be. 
because life goes on and our bills have to be paid and this is our spiritual home so do what you can and also if you can to seriously think about what I was talking about before use this time not to turn inward alone in terms of our spiritual life but outward in terms of spiritual service there are people on your block who may not be able to get to get themselves some groceries or medicine you can help them out there are people who may not need supplies but they they may need you just to reach out to them through a call or a, a knock on the door or an email or a card or any any way you can indicate let's talk about that difficulty in all of us between the selfless and the selfish people are still making a run on particular things in the stores that they don't necessarily need but they want to hoard um, let me announce to you that hoarding is probably a sin so please take what you need but no more than that because there are so many other people out there who are needful too this is a great time for us to test our generosity and it begins at home it begins with each one of us so let's all of us try to say i'll take what i need but i'll be mindful of the others and i'll do for those out there who have no one to care whatever i can because in this testing time i really believe our lord will be so proud of us if we can say lord i responded not with fear alone but with trust in you and generosity to others let's pray nourished with these sacred gifts we humbly beseech you O lord that just as through the death of your son you have brought us to hope what we believe in that so by his resurrection you may lead us to where we hope to live forever in your heavenly kingdom and we ask this through christ our lord amen my friends the lord be with you and may Almighty God bless you and your families in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our Mass is ended. Let us go in peace. Thanks be to God.